Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic and addict. Um, I guess I'll start off with a, you know, um, I grew up on on Travis Air Force Base out in in Fairfield. I grew up in a military home, and um, it was, uh, my my father um, was very strict. You know, he he ran the household like like we were in the military. Um, uh, The reason I say it's dysfunctional was um, I was... Um, one of six kids, and I was the black sheep. Uh, I have a twin brother. Um, he followed my dad's footsteps. Uh, my dad, um, he retired 30 years. My brother's got, my twins got like 20. Um, I didn't I didn't make it into the, uh, the military because of my drinking. Um, I grew up um, fe- feeling like I wasn't wanted. You know, uh, I was a little bit darker than my brother. Um, you know, growing up on base, uh, it's like your own little community. Uh, back in those days, we I used to wear patches, you know, on my knees because, um, you know, there, there was a lot of us. My dad didn't have much rank. So, I, you know, I was always picked on um, growing up. And um, um, because of that, um, you know, I, I fought a lot. Um, I was the only one that was disciplined uh, more than the rest. I had four sisters and, and like I said, and a twin brother and None of them were disciplined the way I was. They were all um, excused from the room, and then my dad would, uh, um, you know, uh, we, we, I got it with the belt. And uh, there was many times where, where my mother came in and would, would tell him to stop, and, you know, that, w- that would just piss him off even more. Um, you know, I, I grew up uh, feeling like I wasn't wanted, like I wasn't wanted, as, you know, as a, as a child. Um, I grew up with a lot of shame and, and guilt. Uh, my release was um, sports. You know, um, my 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 dad signed me up. You know, t ball, and and that's that was my uh, my escape. Um, the first time I drank, uh, I was fourteen, and uh, my my father had thrown a party for my mother, and my job was to make sure everybody um, their cup stayed full and. Um, I'd fill their cup up and I'd take a sip and I'd take it back to them. And next thing you know, it, I was wobbling through the house and my mom looked at me and, and, and said, you know, hey, you, you've been drinking. And, I, and right away, right away, man, I knew I, I was going to be doing that again. Um, I wasn't I wasn't scared anymore. I mean, I could I could I, I felt like I was happy. You know, even at that age, I knew I was going to be doing that again. And, um, you know, uh it started getting um, worse uh, in high school. I was a jock. Somebody always had a, a kegger at their house. Uh, we were always buying beers and, and, uh, and drinking, you know. Um, I ended up marrying my high school sweetheart. Uh, she's in the military. Um, we got stationed out in Georgia. Um, we lived there for 10 years. I have three kids uh, with her. I was out there framing. Um, out there, it seems like that's what everybody did. If you're a carpenter, you, know, you, you smoked and you smoked a lot of weed and, and you drank a lot of beer. And um, uh, you know, my wife would get on would, would get on me because she was in the military, and uh, you know, she got worried sometimes. But um, it never stopped me. You know, I I, I drank so much that uh, I put it before my own kids. Um, I was talking about it. I'm in a program right now called Options, and I, and I was talking about it. Um, I almost, I, I like to say I orphaned my kids, you know, um, my alcohol came before them, you know, when me and my wife, uh, divorced, I, I, I was, uh, it was 2000 and, uh, my kids were young. Uh, I have three Jaime juniors, 28, Maryland's 24 and Travis is 21. And I don't have a relationship with, uh, my daughter or my youngest, my oldest, um, just completed a program. He's got the itch like his dad. Um, he decided to uh, go into a Christian base uh, program, and, and that works for him. You know, um, 
I um, I came to AA first uh, through the courts. Started off uh, getting in trouble in, in school, and then, um, yeah, uh, I, I I I felt like I didn't belong when I first came to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I, I felt different. But it wasn't until I, I showed a little bit of uh, uh, vulnerability, you know, I opened up to an, another man, where the program started working for me. Um, he could relate uh, a lot to what a uh, what I was going through. I met him, as a matter of fact, at Cherry Hill um, five years ago. I don't have five years. I just I just had 90 days. Um, but right on, uh, yeah, I met him. Uh, um, he's been my sponsor ever since. I, you know, I have a tendency to, to uh, do well for myself um, in the Bay, and then I, and I think I'm cured, and, and I fall right back on my face. I lose everything, the house, the car, the tools, everything, everything goes. And um, so I'm back this time, um, working the steps and, and working uh, with my sponsor. Um, there's a, a word that I learned. It's called a uh, attunement. Is when uh, another individual is on the same, or you change your behavior to be on the same um, like wavelength as them. You know, he can relate to me so much. And, uh, and I'm able to share with him my experience and what I went through and then he can relate and I, I get all that stuff out, you know, my four step. And, um, you know, as a result, it's, it's always, uh, improved my life. You know, I, it's just that, uh, I seem to think that I can control my drinking and it's not ever going to happen. It's that I'm an alcoholic. I know that. And, um, I'm just, uh, I, I don't know if any of that made any sense. I'm kind of shaking and shivering, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for asking me to share, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks. I'm Natalie. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Natalie. Um, I am terrified, but I will figure this out. No, actually, I won't figure it out. I'm just going to let God figure it out. There's my, my key issue in life. I always rely on myself. Um. Yeah, so let's talk about how that started. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, I'm an alcoholic. I got sober in July July 8th of 2016, at four days after my 22nd birthday. Um, I had one year of legal drinking, and it was enough, I guess. Many years of illegal drinking. Um, I'll jump back to my childhood um, I grew up with two parents who have their own relationships with alcohol, try not to define it for them, but, um, my father definitely is one of us. Uh, his drinking is a center point of my entire childhood and even our relationship now. Um, I truly didn't think it'd be possible to have a relationship without, without drinking with him. And, um, this program has given me that, um, but yeah, ever since I was young, it was always about drinking. Um, I'm just going to time myself. Excuse me. Drinking, smoking, hiding it from me, me finding it, like the whole, you know, just the, the, the alcoholic circumstances of having kids and um, being an abusive parent and um, being a narcissist. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it was a, it was a really confusing place to grow up. I never knew what my own truth was. Um, and I still struggle with that. And I tell you about that because it's so relevant to my daily life and my alcoholism and my recovery at this point. Um, thankfully, like I said, I get to have relationships with those people and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But, um, the first time I remember drinking, we drink to God we drank to got drunk. We drank <laughs> to get drunk. No questions asked. Like that was the only way to do it. There was no sipping. Neither of me and my friend's parents who we like stole a small water, water bottle full of vodka. And we were like, all right, so this is uh, enough for both of us. Right. And so we just killed it. And, um, we found a car deck of old maid and we were like, I think you play a drinking game. Right. Um, <laughs> And it wasn't really special. We got absolutely blitzed and, like, knocked shit over. And my dad came home, and he's like, what did y'all do? And I was like, 
don't worry about it. Like it wasn't really, <laughs> you know, it wasn't really remarkable. And I don't really remember drinking after that. I know that I started to on a weekly basis. And, um, the first time I remember drinking being soothing and different and the answer in my mind was after I got into a motorcycle accident, um, driving a motorcycle without a helmet, just fucking around on someone's motorcycle in the back of my high school. And, um, I went head over the front wheel, I guess, and, uh, had a brain injury, um, fractured my skull and, uh, fucked myself up real nice. Um, sorry. Uh, if you don't like swearing, I would exit the podcast. Um, <laughs> I'm always thinking about my listeners, you know. Um, <laughs> um, I actually listened to this podcast when I was traveling in Europe, and this shit saved my ass. And I remember listening to my friends and being like, just, it was so comforting to hear my friends in like a land where no one could fucking communicate with me or I couldn't communicate with them. So I do, I'm aware of, of the microphone a little bit. Um, and, and how important this podcast is to some people um, and this show. Um, so I crashed that motorcycle and that brain injury happened and it completely changed my life. Um, totally different person. My mood, you know, post concussive, my moods would swing. My body did things I didn't understand. I was put on uh, antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication and no one followed up with me and like, Everyone was like, oh, you got a little boo-boo on your head. Like, don't worry about it. Just don't do sports for a month. And so after a month, I went back and just, you know, I did softball, basketball, uh, ultimate frisbee, you know. Um, <laughs> I did all the shit. I don't know. Volley? Did I say volley? Who knows? Um, I just did all the things because I didn't. You know, like my, I just wanted my life to be the same and it just wasn't, it was so painful. Uh, like physically speaking, I, my experience with chronic pain started around this time. And I just remember I felt so alone in my own body because I had no control and no idea what I was going to do next. And, um, you know, I had, I had absolutely no way to regulate it. I was given no tools. I was, you know, I had transferred high schools to the big public high school, like, days before, um, you know, I didn't know anyone and no one knew me. So no one knew that I wasn't usually a ultra violent, <laughs> um, you know, like cruel teenager. Well, they're all kind of that way, but, um, you know, I was a totally different person and no one knew, um, you know, and my parents tried to help me, but I was just like, I just, I was inconsolable. I mean, it was a really hard time for me. And, um, you know, my, my life changed at that time, but my life also started at that time. Like, I don't really remember much else besides, um, adjusting and just constantly, um, constantly advocating for myself. So that we'll, we'll chalk that up as a blessing, but, um, I use that word very sparingly. Um, so I, I remember taking my, my first drink and my first drug. Of course I did both, um, after this accident and I, and just like the relief that I felt the physical relief that I felt, we all know the chill that goes down your spine. Um, and I was like, Oh, this is how I'm going to be okay. Like, this is how it's going to work out. Um, you know, and I just did drugs at lunch, drank after, um, I also talk about drugs in my story. They're mentioned in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so I talk about them because they're relevant to me and, uh, drugs are other forms of alcohol to me. I do it all alcoholically, um, even relationships, uh, <laughs> and food. So, um, you know, and that, that is effectively what the rest of my educational experience has been is, um, up until I got sober is, just kind of whatever cocktail could make me able to show up and, um, to any commitment, any school activity I had, I moved to Colorado. I went to school in Boulder somehow, no idea how that worked out. Um, you know, I found the people there that like stole nitrous tanks and like 
you know, always had parties. And I just, I was like, I felt constantly alone. I never felt like I was being my true and earnest self, but I thought that's what college was <laughs> and high school was, you know, like I, I, no one's ever like, Oh, I fucking love high school, you know, or I love college. I guess people say that, but I, I just, you know, I just didn't know anything else. And, um, I, you know, I was just so uncomfortable and so alone and just started using drugs more and more each day in my room, um, started selling them, started, you know, alcohol was constant. I mean, my parents would supply me with alcohol when they, when they came, um, which was normal. Everything was, all these alcoholic behaviors were so normalized, um, by me and everyone else. And, um, yeah, it was just, just carried on. Of course I, my drug abuse and drug and alcohol abuse, um, made me not such a great student. So I dropped out, moved back and got a restaurant job. Um, cause that is what successful people do. Um, <laughs> kidding. Uh, yeah. And that was really another gateway into a different phase of alcoholism where cocaine was involved and, um, you know, my self-esteem became lower and lower. I did less and less acts that aligned with my principles as a person, meaning like I just gave pieces of myself to people and, um, I didn't, I, I knew myself less and less each day. Like it just felt like my soul was being sucked out of my body. <laughs> um, I just laughed because that sounds quite dramatic, but that is exactly what it felt like. You know, it's just like with each drink, with each person I woke up next to who I was like, who are you? Um, you know, like with each lie and each, uh, yeah, just more lies. And then each thing I stole from my parents and my family, um, you know, it just, it just became worse and worse. And I had no concept of honesty at the time. Um, and it just, it felt like each day I just eroded a little bit more. Um, thankfully, I got a job teaching at an after school program. Those kids truly kept me sober for the year before um, rehab. Uh, you know, I was in all these abusive relationships and like the joy of just coming. Well, I was like in a lot of pain and always hung over. But there were little bits of joy that I got from those kids that really like kept me together. And gave me purpose, um, purpose that I have today through this program that I didn't have back then. Um, and ultimately like my chronic pain was creeping up on me. I wasn't taking care of myself. Um, and finally I became, I was, I was living with my mom at the time as all successful women do, um, <laughs> some point in their lives. I'm probably going to do it again soon. Thank God I have boundaries now. Um, you know, I, I was living with her and I was being emotionally abusive. Um, I did not treat her, definitely didn't treat with her with respect. And I just taught, I treated her the way my father treated us. Um, you know, I was just cruel to her, judgmental, uh, impatient. Um, yeah. And I mean, I was, I was like that with the people I was closest to. Um, and that is such a painful thing to, to see myself doing that and, uh, to not, to not feel like I had control over my own behavior. And, um, I used alcohol and drugs as an excuse for that so much so that one day, basically like the accidental intervention that my family celebrated me with, um, threw me, uh, they were all just like, you fucking suck. Like we are so tired of being around you and just your behavior is just so foul. And, um, you know, I knew it, they weren't wrong. Uh, and I was like, I mean, I'm addicted to drugs and alcohol. So what are you going to do? Like, there's nothing you can do. Uh, like it's just unfixable. Um, and I wasn't, you know, I was like, I take no responsibility. Like it's just drugs and alcohol. And they're like, you can do things about that. Like you can, go places and like, stop doing that. And I was like, no, that's never going to happen. Like it, I, it never, it's still amazing to me that it never occurred to me that drugs and alcohol were the problem. Um, because I hadn't gotten to like where I thought my father was and I hadn't gotten to like where other alcoholics I knew of were like to those depths. Um, 
but I was super suicidal at this time and super suicidal isn't like a great way to phrase it. Sounds a little more excited than I wanted to, but, um, you know, I was like severely, I was a danger to myself. Um, you know, and there were many times in which I had to tell, I had to share that with other people to protect myself. Um, and yeah. And so long story short, I agreed to go into rehab on the guise of chronic pain. I was like, all right, it's going to help my pain. Like, and maybe I want to kill myself less. Maybe drugs and alcohol will like stopping those will like cleanse me and I'll just come out this new person. And I was like, great. Sounds like a plan. Um, I was also pregnant at the time and I didn't know it. Um, and so a couple of days before I went into rehab, I lost, um, that pregnancy from drinking and using, uh, that was a really, you know, I, I share this because it was so, it was, it made me want to drink more than anything else. Like I share that because I came in here and I, after rehab and I shared about it and people welcomed me and women shared their experiences with me. And, um, it was really, you know, rehab was a really safe place for me to go and grieve. Um, I don't think I knew that's what I was doing. Um, but that was a really important piece for me. And like the women in the, this program have held me, um, every year when I go, when I experience that date again, um, these women show up for me every year. So, um, yeah. All right. That's uncomfortable. And I'm going to move on from that. Ugh. Um, so I got sober. I went to rehab with, uh, women my age, which was, uh, so fucking important to my story. At least, um, I did not like women my age. I was not a fan. Um, I did not get along with them. Uh, historically. And that was the best medicine at that point in time. Um, I got to see other women who understood their disease and understood that picking up a program was the only way that we were going to be able to, to survive. Um, women who had gone to rehab a couple more times than me, who had OD'd, who had, you know, I had gotten very ill from my use, but I definitely saw their disease working. And that was, um, you know, alongside my own, but that was definitely to watch others who were also not wanting to get sober to be like, no, I just OD'd and like, I'm covered in track marks and like my life is a dumpster fire, but like, I still want to get right back out there. And, um, I was like, Oh wow. Holy shit. Like to watch that that disease of the mind, um, was really, it was a powerful experience. Um, yeah, what I came out of rehab with, which is absolutely a privilege. Like if you didn't have to go to rehab and you're, or you didn't get to go to rehab and you're sober, like fucking amazing. Like I, that is a miracle, a true miracle. Um, that is, that is where God exists for me. And, and because I have no idea. Uh, you know, I'm sure the people who, who got sober that way have no idea either, but, um, how, how that, how that happened, but that is, that is where God exists for me. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, yeah, I came out of there willing. I saw my disease. Um, I wasn't fully convinced. I was like, I'm still pretty young. I still have a couple more years where my liver could probably take it. Um, and yeah, I, but then I was also faced with the fact that like, well, you kind of wanted to kill yourself every day. So I don't know if you would make it much further. Um, I'm a very, <laughs> I really love logic. Uh, and this program, a lot, a lot of the time, I can't rely on that. But in terms of my alcoholism, like I have the, I have the evidence. Um, I hopefully won't need to go and gather more, but that's just for today. Um, so I came out, I, I was over on that little island off of Oakland over there where I grew up um, from San Francisco, rare one, I know. Um, and I went to a meeting, I went to my first meeting and I was like, holy shit, I'm the youngest one by like 40 years. I was like, 
God damn it. Uh, is this what it's going to be like, you know? Um, and I got my first sponsor there. Um, and those women are still in my life today. Like my judgment was total horseshit. Um, you know, like nothing I thought I knew was relevant. And that is my experience for so much of this program. Like my judgments I have, my preconceived notions are just bullshit. Um, and so I was really shown that through this community and they really held me and, um, began to walk me through the steps as reluctant as I was, um, this lang- the language of the big book, although so valuable, really threw me off at first. Not that I could read very well. It was still a little foggy, but, um, yeah, it threw me off at first and it took, you know, I knew I had a problem, but the willingness to work the steps, uh, did not come quickly. So someone really had to drag me towards it and bless them. Um, you know, I saw that it was the way that people got well. Um, I heard that, but, um, I needed to just wait and get really uncomfortable. And that, you know, that unfortunate trait of mine really follows me today. Um, I got a sponsor. I started working the steps with her. The third step was fucking baffling. Um, I had to really just ex- all I could accept at that time was there is something bigger than myself, which I read Judy Bloom's Hello, God, Are You There? It's Me, Margaret. And I was like, OK, I, you know, because that's literally the only reference I had. Also, if she comes at me for copyright, sorry. <laughs> you know, that's like the only reference I had to God. And I grabbed that little tiny book off my shelf and I read it. Cause I remember when I was like, when my, my dad would hit me and I'd be like, why is this happening? When I was a little child, like I would pray or I would say like, are you there God? And like still sometimes I find myself doing that. And so I, I haven't said that before. That's a interesting little story. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I really had to. I had to not complicate it. And still today I have to keep it so simple. The logic of it, it doesn't make any fucking sense to me why I'm okay. Why I've survived all these different, you know, I've had lots of car accidents too that I didn't talk about. I've had many brain injuries I've many concussions. Like I should not be okay. I should not be talking. Um, and so my sponsor helped me walk through those experiences in my life. And I was able to identify like, yeah, I've, None of that I had control over and really looking back at my, at my life and making sense of events that I had no control over really helped me, um, walk through the third step. The fourth step I avoided like the plague. Um, I literally took an internship in New York. I was like, bye, I've got a cool old sober boyfriend. That's really awesome. He's like, knows the steps. So we're good, which, (laughs) which I would not suggest to anyone, um, to do, but you know, my sponsor was even like, Hey, you remember how we talked about not sleeping with anyone before your third, before your fifth step. And I was like, that was a suggestion. Um, you know, and it is a suggestion. Apparently I needed to ignore. I needed to realize how painful that was to, give a piece of myself away to someone and not, um, and not feel okay about it. You know, um, this person was safe, which was like a huge change from the people I had, uh, dated before. Like they didn't hit me. They weren't an active alcoholic. They weren't stealing from me, like light years different. Um, but it wasn't what I needed and it wasn't what I wanted. And I, you know, I wouldn't change that experience for the world. Um, I needed to fuck around and find out as one of my dear friends says, um, whenever I'm like, okay, let me run this idea by you. I think it's really bad, but like, I really want to do it. And he's like, you should fuck around and find out. And I was like, (laughs) okay, Um, good advice. He's like, it wasn't advice. I was like, okay. Um, yeah. So I, all these experiences, like I, I waited on my four step. I went away. I was like, I'm living the promises. 
Um, but I got to know AA in New York. I got to meet all these different people. I got to realize that this program can carry me across cities, across jobs, across different experiences and through different experiences is really what I'm talking about. Um, and I made such amazing friends. I actually went back and it's not just all about friends, y'all. I know that, but I mean, I didn't have people that cared about me. People from New York still call me. I go out there to see their children. I go to see them get married. I, um, you know, this program makes my life full. And that was a beautiful experience in learning about that. And also learning that, like, this program makes my life full, but it doesn't make me happy. Um, I have to work it to stay happy and content. Um, I came back here. Of course, I... I have like the amazing gift of being able to go to school. I say, of course, cause I feel like that is a piece of everyone's story. They're like, I got sober. I went to school, but like, fuck that's, I couldn't, I could barely read when I came in here. So I'm in school. Um, I'm about to graduate. Um, let me just center here for a second. I wrote some, some hot takes before I started. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to come back to the steps. They have been really challenging for me. I worked them in no way quickly. I was I dragged my ass through the entire first round of my steps. Um, it was so uncomfortable. I became um, I was suicidal for a period of time because I made another person my higher power, um, which it was and is because I still do it a very valuable experience because I got to know how to dig myself out of it and like get back into program and call people and, uh, work on getting sponsees and know how to care for myself because really I came in here and I had no skills. I had no, I mean, skills is like some shit you put on your resume, but I truly didn't know the basic, like how to care for myself things. Like how do you find comfort on a Friday night? when you want to go like fuck shit up, like I, you know, just like ruin my life in so many different ways, whether it's like a giant piece of chocolate cake, like a man that may not be the best choice, a person more so, um, you know, just like, I was like any of the options and I had all these like not so esteemable acts laid in front of me. And I'm like, I'm in a fucking color. Like, I guess God wants me to color tonight because that is how I cause myself the least amount of pain. And I know you're like, oh, God, this woman's talking about coloring. But I, you know, it's what I'm coming back to is like, I'm just trying to like harm reduce over here. And thank God, I, you know, the first thing I do is pick up the phone and call another person because that has also been so helpful to work my steps. I work my steps with other people. Um, I call them, we walk through them together. Um, yeah, there's no wrong way to work the steps in my opinion. Um, I've had sponsees be like, no, I want to do a step a week. And I'm like, that's really cool. It sounds like your will. Um, we're going to do whatever we need to do to get through the steps. And if that's not at your pace and people have said this to me, Oh my God, over and over again. Cause I'm like, this is my schedule. Um, even though I go really slow most of the time. Um, <laughs> and you know, I ultimately trust, I trust my sponsor and my, I, when I call my sponsor, um, and tell her how I want to do the steps, what my schedule is, what I'm thinking, you know, I get to hear, um, I'm matched with, with serenity, you know, and that is, that is, wow. Something I used to just call my mom when everything went wrong. Um, still learning. That's not the right answer. Um, you know, and now I actually each really each day I gain more trust for my sponsor. Um, and it's not really if they're, whether they're trustworthy or not, it's that what I'm willing to give up to them. It's what I'm willing to trust them with. And, um, unsurprisingly, I am not, I'm not easily, or I don't trust easily. And, um, I've gotten to really break down walls in this program around that walls that I had no fucking idea I had. And that's really like 
what this third year has been about is all these walls that I had no idea existed, whether it's in whether it's in relationships with family, whether it's in romantic relationships, those are a fucking doozy. I can't, I'm not going to thank God for Al-Anon, you know, um, I'm not going to drag that in here as much as I would like to <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, you know, I just learned so much from them. Um, I also take a lot of what I learned from this program through working the steps to my therapist because um, she gets to help me walk through, you know, the next the next level of looking at my my experience and my trauma. Um, not that I don't think I could take it to my sponsor, but that woman has a job and a life. Um, <laughs> and. Yeah, I just, um, sorry, I take moments like this. I don't want to talk out of my ass. Um, all right, relationships challenging. There we go. That header's off. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's really what AA is for me now is, um, having to take real careful, close care of my side of the street through 10 steps, through daily inventories, through, um, amends and just, um, really caring for myself. So I don't pop off all day, um, or just make poor choices. I mean, hungry, angry, lonely, tired is like the most relevant to me on a daily basis. And I wish it was more complicated than that. Like I want to pretend that I'm a complex person who needs all these different things, but like that's where it begins every day with me. Um, just bouncing around here. Um, so actually that I can lead into talking about how I just changed sponsors. Um, I celebrated my birthday on July eighth of this year. And, um, a couple days earlier, someone I had met in my first 30 days, uh, overdosed and died. And, um, yeah, I wasn't really in the celebrating mood. Uh, I'm also really grateful to have walked through that experience with other alcoholics because that like her service, the people that rallied around her, her community, um, she had been in recovery for a while. Uh, that was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, you know? Um, I thought about my funeral a lot before I got sober. Don't worry, this will, I'll, up, I'll uptick this in a moment. But um, I, I thought about it a lot. And, like, it wasn't a great, like, I didn't expect a lot of people to come or care for me. And that's really what I'm focused on. And, like, the way that our that this community shows up for, uh, shows up for this person at least was like nothing I've ever seen. Um, it was a celebration of this person's life because we all at, at that moment, like understood, understood on some level her suffering. Um, you know, I had been there for sure. And, um, I'm just impressed, like the most impressive piece of it all. And I'm saying it left an impression on me, um, is what I mean, was just to see the hole that she left and, um, see how her friends and her family and AA really honored that. And, um, you know, and she ultimately like her spirit brought people together and like brought people closer in our program. And, um, she would have loved that. And, um, yeah, so that experience was really crucial for me, um, to show me, to remind me around that birthday, how valuable my sobriety is and how fatal it can really be. Um, yeah, I, that brought me closer to other women, um, her sponsee, you know, just, and I'm so her, her, you know, I should be more anonymous. <laughs> Her friend celebrated two years this week. And just to watch that person pick up that chip and to 
to have walked through this experience without drinking. Um, I just cried my ass off. Um, it was, it's so powerful. And, um, yeah, sorry, I'll get the energy up here, but, um, I just, I'm just reminded constantly about how, how important this program is, um, and how really it keeps me alive. I mean, I was, um, before I came here tonight, I was coloring. I just started doing it this week, so don't think I'm a big old freak. Um, <laughs> or maybe I did it a couple months ago, too. True. Confessions. Um, you know, and because that, <laughs> I was telling my friend before the meeting, like, my, what goes on between my ears is fucking hard. Like, I am my worst enemy. Um, my brain really likes to beat itself up. Um, and I've gone through a couple really challenging moments in the past couple of weeks. And um, I'm really, like, questioning my self-worth and my value and, like, I was feeling like shit today and I called a friend um, and she, you know, she just like gave me perspective. Like I was like, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life and I'm going to be fucking coloring on my deathbed. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and she was like, yeah, but listen to this shit show my friend is having like in her life. And I was like, oh, and she's like, and you're not drinking. And I was like, mm hmm. And, you know, it just that little perspective and getting out of my own head is so crucial. Um, and I just looked over at my mom and I was just, um, I just said, like, I don't know what I would have without these resources, without these tools I've learned, without putting my ego aside and just calling someone crying um, and without just like being able to go home today and, you know, read something out of my big book. Cause I definitely have a big book next to my bed. I'm one of those people. Um, and like center myself, you know, every day I feel like throughout the day, I get a little further from myself, a little further from my program and my higher power. And at any moment I have the opportunity to like pull myself back in, um, and bring myself, back to saying, hi, I'm Natalie. I'm an alcoholic. Because when I say those words, I feel relief. Um, and if anything, that is so clear to me each time I come here. Um, I have a couple more minutes. Uh, I'll just, that would be a great place to end, but <laughs> yeah, you know what? That sounds great. Um, I'm really grateful to be an alcoholic. I never thought that would be the case. And um, it's brought me, it's brought me my entire life, you know. Um, it really, that was a really long share. What a journey. Um, <laughs> so much sweating. Uh, so thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.